So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Karen Goodell and I'm the director of the Scoville Memorial Library. And we're glad you're here tonight for our presentation and discussion of Annie Poole's book, Ben Bog and Swamp, um, which you may or may not have read, but you might want to read it after being here this evening. Um, so I just want to, first of all, recognize um, May Castleberry, our program coordinator, for putting this all together. And also um, Elizabeth Slotnick from the Salisbury Land Trust, who um, recommended Vivian as a person that could help guide in this conversation. And then Vivian um, brought in the wonderful Michael Clemens here to, to become this dynamic duo that you have here uh, to discuss this important topic tonight. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes to do a brief introduction of our presenters. Um, we have Dr. Michael Clemens is a distinguished conservation biologist, a member of the scientific staff at the American Museum of Natural History, and an expert on Connecticut's wetlands. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, and Vivian Garfine uh, served in various capacities during her 26 year tenure with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And most recently as the director of the Central District from 1995 until her retirement in 2012. And she currently serves as an alternate member of the Salisbury Inland Wetland and Waterways Commission. So many thanks to you both for being here tonight. Um, as I said, we're going to hold questions till the very end, and then we'll, you know, be happy to start the discussion. But without further ado, I'm going to start the presentation here and turn it over to our distinguished panel. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, May, for putting us together. Can everybody hear me okay? You don't project very well. Okay. <laughs> And welcome everyone. It's, it's, uh, it was a fun book. So Annie Poole researched and wrote this book in order to gain a better understanding of that was in so doing, she discovered the important role they play in preserving the environment. <clears throat> Even more than forests, wetlands store carbon emissions that accelerate climate change. Simply put, wetlands are intimately tied to the climate crisis. Few people understand the vitality, the vitally important role wetlands play in preserving the environment. Fens, bogs, swamps, and marine estuaries actually store carbon dioxide and methane. Methane is 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in its ability to push the warming of the world. To destroy these wetlands is to release vast volumes of these dangerous elements into the Earth's atmosphere. As Pruel takes us around the world her, in her excellent discussion of wetlands, her urgent plea is for wetland preservation and reclamation. We'll take a look at what Pruel has to say about each type of wetland, a, a bog and a, a fan, a bog and a swamp. And then Michael will talk with us about the environmental riches we have here in Connecticut particularly in the Northwest corner. And we're very thrilled to have him here as our expert. Before Poole begins her individual chapters on fens, bogs, and swamps, she gives her discursive thoughts on wetlands, which is both poetic and informative. Here are but a few gems from that chapter. The history of wetlands is the history of their destruction. Of what? Of their destruction. destruction. Peatlands, a type of wetlands, or all wetlands are somewhat peatlands, can hold huge amounts of carbon dioxide. Rip or take the cover off of these wetlands, our peatlands, and out comes carbon dioxide and methane. The Amazon, once considered the great storehouse of CO2, was once considered the great storehouse of CO2. And a recent study shows that with <coughs> impacts, deforestation, fires, wetland drainage projects, the Amazon is now emitting more CO2 than it sequesters. Recent horrific and destructive fires around the globe in 2019 and 2020 are adding to the already negative impact the warming trends have had on global per permafrost. Greenhouse gases long held below the surface by permafrost <laughs> are added to the climate, 
Hmm. In addition, the forest fires have dropped heavy drop deposits of soot on the melting ice. The soot reduces reflectivity, hmm. absorbs heat, and pushes the melt rate even higher. Cruel fears we are at a tipping point when badly savaged forests are unable to regenerate. <laughs> A friend beginning to read this book asked me, why bother? We already know global warming and climate crisis. Well, Cruel answers with these words. These are, Before the last wetlands disappear, I wanted to know more about this world we are losing. What was a world of fens, bogs, and swamps? And what meaning did these wetlands have, not only for humans, but for all other life on Earth? So now let's take a closer look. Are the English fens. These early fens covered 15,500 square miles. The piecemeal drainage of the fens over centuries by various project or projectors made fatal progress problems of fragmentation. Today, less than 1% of the original fens remain. People lived in those fens for thousands of years through the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic times, the Bronze and Iron Ages, the Saxon years, the Roman centuries, and the medieval centuries. The fens were a source of wealth that could hardly be surpassed by any other natural environment. Over millennia, the fenlanders observed and worked out how to manage the wetlands how to repair and augment natural banks and river flooding or rising seawaters or heavy rains. It's an old story now. People with no understanding of the annual maintenance of wetlands or wetlands or finlands moved in and improvements began. The finlanders fought back, but they were eased out or forced off their lands they had traditionally held in common. These wetlands were considered worthless and could be taken from people deemed inferior. The fens were modified for cattle pasturage and then to wheat fields through intense drainage schemes. The conversion of wetlands to cropland increased methane and CO2 output. There is consideration of conserving, of converting these artificially dry lands back to fen, bog and swamp, it is expensive to maintain the soils for agriculture and they continue to emit CO2. Wetland reclamation would reduce the CO2 emissions. However, agricultural interests are entrenched. And I'll take a moment and just say, think Everglades. <laughs> At the end of this chapter, Cruel observes, in the natural world, you can't easily put back what is gone. Humans are exceedingly good at construction and destruction, but pitifully inadequate at restoring the natural world. It's just not our thing. So, do we have fins in this part of the world? We do. But I'd like to say one thing about humans. About <laughs> humans. <laughs> um, someone who studies turtles that live over 100 years. I've always been amazed that the way humans look at the world in very small, self-interested, small pieces. They don't mind the vision to even see a hundred years, let alone a thousand years. That's what we're up against. Short-term gain versus long-term vision. And that's an important observation, I think, because a lot of my career has been taking science and putting it into practice. How do you take science and use it? And I, the one thing was to mention the introduction, part of that is my work as the chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission here in Salisbury, trying to get better planning, better wetland conservation. So yes, we do have beds. Let me first talk about the book. As Vivian said, it uses the Anglo-Saxon definition of fens, which is not the way we use the term here in the Northeast. And this hasn't always been so. For example, that grassy and marshlands around Boston were once 
term depends after the old English usage. Hence, Fenway Park, which was located in the midst of those fans. And that is what a small reminder of the huge grassy meadows that were part of Boston. So fans as we know them in Connecticut, New England, are extremely specialized wetlands. They're largely open canopy. That means they do not have extensive tree cover of openness, which is very important for biological activity. And there's a steady seepage of groundwater that breaks out of glacial terraces. Glacial terraces are the deposits of till, gravel, and sand that occur all around Salisbury. If you go along under Mountain Road, all of that is one huge glacial <coughs> terrace until you get to the mountain. And because these are such interesting and rare habitats, they have a whole host of rare species. This is a fan nearby. Here is a fan in Salisbury, actually, that is being destroyed by people driving their trucks through it. And you can look at the, the rich, mucky um, basement of the fans. You can see the brownness, the peat. Everything is locked up. When it gets churned up like that, all that methane starts to be released. Um, we have two types of fens here in Salisbury. And Salisbury actually has more fens than any other town in Connecticut. We are fen central. <laughs> um, and you may want to ask why. Well, part of it has to do with Salisbury's biogeographical position in the state. Biogeographical is where we're located in regard to all the other attributes of biology. We're in a calcareous limestone valley, and those are unusual habitats. If you look in Connecticut, you'll find the limestone valleys really in the western part of the state, sort of ribbons. So most of our fens are what we call sloping fens, like the picture there. And they contain wonderful examples of rare species. <laughs> sort of the, the real signature of the fen is the federally endangered, federally threatened state endangered bog turtle. This is a hatchling. And I can tell it's a hatchling. If you look below its nose, there's a little piece of tissue that's called the caruncle or egg tube. That signifies that the turtles have just come out of the egg. Here are bog turtles hatching in Sphere's sphagnum. And actually, turtles are folded over like this in the egg and they unfold when they come out. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, we have lost many of our fens already in Salisbury. Um, along Hammertown Road, there's a series of large ponds. At one time, that was one of the most important fens in Salisbury. It was excavated, dug out. You have those ponds, which are basically not really biologically valuable. And of course, you begin the cycle of the release of the methane that was caught up in the fen. Fens are so sensitive to so many things, nutrient inputs, invasive plants, and dewatering and outright destruction. However, very compatible grazing cattle on low numbers maintains fens. So we talked about the Hammertown Road fen, Another very important fan was located on Route 112 between Hotchkiss School and Lime Rock. And that's largely been lost by dewatering. There's a series of operations along that road, uh, agricultural, that have been pumping out large amounts of groundwater, water table sinks, and the fan dies. It's a very delicate balance. So, what would be on fence? Yeah, yeah, there it is. There is a fen that's invaded by Phragmites. That's one of the invasive plants for managing that by mowing it to keep some of it open. We have more fens or not? I don't think so. We're not. Well, 
<clears throat> protecting beds is very difficult. We really don't have everything in our local toolbox even to do it. Most recently, the Salisbury Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Agency was unable to control by regulation the cutting of trees adjacent to a very important bed. What's interesting is it was because forestry is considered a form of agriculture and state law gives broad deference to agriculture. The time is at hand really to begin to look at those broad agricultural exemptions. But to put it into perspective, the town, when we had the transfer station, some of you may remember, it was relocated from where it was, 200 feet up the hill, away from the bend because the Department of Environmental Protection considered the transfer station development and it needed to be moved further away to protect the bank. However, on private land adjacent to it, we were unable to control logging right down to the edge of the bank because of this grotesque, in my opinion, agricultural exemption, which I believe the legislature needs to look at. Done. Okay. Bogs are next. <laughs> Moving right along. Thank you. If you like archaeology, you're gonna love <laughs> Poole's chapter on bogs. I'll leave the science of the bogs to Michael. I just have to touch on the bog bodies. Well preserved human bodies pulled out of bogs. Some one in particular example, red hair, still red and intact on this person. It's amazing. Most were alive during the Bronze and Iron Ages. They are diverse, men, women, children, commoners, and kings. In Ireland, if a harvest failed or, cat or, catas or catastrophe struck, catastrophe struck, excuse me, the king was sacrificed to the bog. What a concept. <laughs> 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 Wetland archaeologists have been busy studying and dating when these humans lived. A discovery at a Clovis, New Mexico bog site was initially accepted as the indication of earliest human settlers in the Americas. This was over 11,000 11, years ago. This led to the belief that the first people in North America crossed the Bering Strait from Eurasia to North America. However, a peat bog found in Mont Verde in southern Chile found objects excellently preserved, dated to 14,000 years ago, which predates the Clovis find. So with Mont Verde, scientists began to discuss alternative or additional coastal boat or raft travel to South America along the resource-rich kelp highway or shoreline. Then finds in 2009, of ancient footprints in White Sands National Park in New Mexico and follow-up studies of seeds uncovered in thick layers of ancient ditch grass dated these back to more than 23,000 years ago. As of now, the footprints and the seeds are accepted as the earliest proof of humans in America, whether by land or by sea, as the ancestors of most indigenous cultures in America. Now, I don't have time to cover Das Grosses Moor et Calcris again in <laughs> AD 9, otherwise known as the story of how local knowledge of a great bog defeated, yea, annihilated three Roman legions. Don't miss this amazing story. It starts on page 115. <laughs> Tell us about bugs. That's a pretty hard act to follow. Um, Here's it was. <laughs> bogs are characterized by acidic soils. And I've mentioned before, we are lying in a large limestone underlain in glacial sand. <clears throat> Our soils tend to be alkaline or circumneutral. We don't have many bogs here in Salisbury. The ones we do have are on the Riga Plateau, the very, that on the Taconic Uplift. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Taconic Uplift. I think many of us say, oh, it's big mountains that define Salisbury. But they're a very unique form of mountain, very old, and they form a wall 
and the most noticeable, if you drive up Route 22, you see that fall. If you look into the valley, you'll see the work of the glacier. At least the first part, north of Millerton, you will see a series of hills. Some of them actually farmed. If you look at these hills, they're one thing in common. They're teardrop shape, and the largest end of the tier is the southern part. These are drumlins. It's a drumlin field. A drumlin is left by the glacier as it moved back maybe 12,000 years ago, it dropped <coughs> little hills. And you see the Bromlin field. It's a wonderful thing. We'll look at that as you go up through 22. Interestingly enough, it disappears very quickly. By the time you get to the Nostra kiln, it's flat as could be. That's just one area. That just shows you that you really have to think about large time gaps when you think about landscape. The next time you go up 22, look for the Drummond field. It's one of the most beautiful and interesting glacial features. So really to see more bogs in Connecticut, we have to go eastward. Bogs share one thing in common with fens. They're primarily open wetland. They can be quite treacherous to explore. Most have a ring of open water or a moat around the edge. And if you look at them from afar, many of them rise up in the center. That is the layers and layers of peat rise up and the moats goes around it. The bog mat is fascinating, but quite interesting. How many of you tried to walk across the waterbed? <laughs> so that's exactly what bog mat is like. You go out, you start walking slowly, and before you know, the whole thing is undulating. And if you fall through, you're in big trouble because you can break through and it's hard to get out because you try to grab and you try to grab, that breaks away. Um, you can only imagine all those poor people felt being sacrificed. <laughs> Some of the most interesting bogs are found in Pebbles. You know, I talk a lot about glacial geology because the glacial geology is really what drives so many of our habitats. Kettles are depressions in primarily sandy soils. They're often quite deep because what they are, large blocks of glacial ice that melted in these big, deep, round ponds. You see a lot on Cape Cod. <laughs> many kettles contain large bogs characterized by cranberry, peat. <clears throat> oh, grass of Parnassus. That's a pen plant. That was supposed to be the pens. Oh, sorry about that. What about that? Sundew. <laughs> Bingo. Sundews are, let, let's keep that up there. Um, so I could tell a story about kettles and bogs. Some kettles are full of Peat. Others have peat way down and they're full of muck. And I remember with clarity an almost dry kettle hole on a Quidnick Island in Narragansett Bay. That's in Rhode Island. A Quidnick mm -hmm. is the same island that has Newport on it. And I was doing a study in the bay. And it was fascinating. This kettle had a very shallow layer of water in it. It looked muddy, and the whole top was teeming with turtles and frogs and everything. <laughs> and my job was to sort of see what species were there. So I thought you had the colony. So I just said, oh, I'm going to go there, wait in there. And I waited in. As I looked, there's a the bottler's toad, or this leopard frog. Louder, I, please. I, saw, I started saying, here's a bottler's toad, here's a leopard frog, it's a painted turtle, a spotted turtle. I was calling them out to my colleague who was writing them down a notebook. And he finally said, you know, Dr. Lemons, you're sinking. <laughs> <laughs> and by that time, I was already up to my waist. And I hadn't realized that I was going down. 
Anyway, fortunately, he had a boat. We toured across this quivering heap of mud. I wrapped it around myself. With quite some effort, I came out like a cork. <laughs> All I can say was, had I been alone, I may have ended up a well-preserved dog perfect person. <laughs> but I was not sacrificed. I would have been sacrificed on the altar of science. <laughs> So let's talk a bit about bog plants. Bogs are nutrient poor. So many of the plants are adapted to uh, compensate for the lack of protein. Here you have the round load sundew, little sticky tops. And you see there it's catching insects, which it digests. That's how it makes up for the protein imbalance. Next, please. Pitcher plants are a variation on the same theme. Uh, the insects are attracted to that pattern, that sort of uh, like a window screen pattern. That is a really attractant for flies and other insects. They go there and they start to follow it right down into the well where they're ingested by. Uh, Acids. Also, can see some other bog plants. There's fat, level leaf. Bogs have a rich variety of plants. What's next? What's next? That's your plant. <laughs> I, that's I an, just know it was a bog plant. That's an oh, it's the next. Okay. Yeah. I have a question, though. Nobody else can ask it. What I couldn't quite understand, and maybe you can help me out here, is the chemistry of the bogs and why these humans were so perfectly preserved down there for millennia. Acid. Acid. Tannin. You used to use, when you do leather, mm -hmm. you use hemlock and other things. They're, they're tanned, basically. Perfect preservative. Mm -hmm. That's what I didn't know. Recently, there was a, a recent discovery of, you know, read about it, in sort of mud in, in southern Italy all these perfectly preserved statues of mud from a sort of thermal spring. Nothing preserves <clears throat> anything better than low pH and lack of oxygen. <clears throat> and that's both what you have in these bogs. Okay. Let me get my computer back up. So we're ready for swamps? Sure, go for it. Swamps are my favorite weapon. <laughs> This is in Florida. It's a cypress, um, hardwood cypress swamp. <clears throat> you won't see many of these. If any, do you see any cypress swamps in, in uh, Connecticut? Oh. Not I just couldn't. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't resist these two. And uh, just to get us started, these are cypress swamps in south of Tallahassee, where I lived for many years. So I couldn't resist bringing these pictures along. Um, Scientists have estimated that in the early 17th century, approximately 220 million sopping acres existed over the land mass that became the United States, 221 million. And much of it was swamp. By the 1980s, American wetlands were wiped out roughly by half, and in some states, more. In 1990, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service published a study showing that since the 1600s, the country's treasury of wetlands had shriveled to 103 million acres from 200 And some states lost almost all of their original wetlands. Between 2004 and 2009, another 62 1,300 acres disappeared to agricultural interest in housing and, and housing developers. And I suspect that's 13 years ago. Many more have been lost by today. What do I love so much about the swamps, especially the swamps, the swamps of Florida? Bird life. This is my favorite, the limpkin. I actually took this. I was on a boardwalk right above her, and she had just caught her snail. They, they eat on snails. Swamps and birds go together, and when the swamp disappears, <clears throat> so do the birds. Cruel highlights mangrove swamps in this section. 
no one should ever underestimate the importance of mangrove and mangrove swamps. Again, we're not going to find any in Connecticut, but they're in the book and they are wonderful. They're superior absorbers of CO2, five times more efficient than tropical forests. They are breeding grounds and protective nurseries. They provide shelter for small fish. They stabilize shorelines. And where, are, where there are mangrove forests, there is protection against hurricanes. I would love to go to where we were last year, um, which is close to where this is. And there are thick mangrove forests and see if they survive the hurricane ion, because we know that most buildings there did not. And it's a wonderful treat to take your grandchildren <laughs> over to Lover's Key in a kayak for their first trip through the uh, mangrove forests um, on a trip to Florida. So they got a first-hand lesson on mangroves. <laughs> We're going to turn our attention now. I think that's where I wanted to be. That's where we wanted to be, Michael. Um, to the wetlands in our area, I'm still learning about them from this master here, as you can well imagine. So let's talk about the wetlands, the other kinds of wetlands we have here in well, this, this part of the world. This is the tussock swamp. Um, primarily the tussocks are care restrictive. Um, and you see what happens is open water goes to shrub, goes to forest. And historically, this balance has been maintained by one animal, the beaver, which is basically a landscape architect. It cuts down, it floods, the dam breaks out, you have a beaver meadow, then you have shrubs, then you have forest again. That cycle was greatly disturbed uh, the last 200 years. We had hardly any beavers. So red maple swamps have grown up all over the place. Um, we have many fine examples of wooded swamps in this area. And the pretty easy way to identify a wooded swamp is in early autumn, because the red maples that live in them turn red far before most other trees turn. And if you want to see a beautiful swamp, you just go up Route 7 through Falls Village and you go through Robin Swamp, which is a fantastic, uh, diverse swamp. Uh, one of the first things I did as a grad student back at the place to see was <laughs> did an inventory of Robin Swamp and found out how incredibly rich it was, which led to a lot of protection. Here we go with the glaciers again, Robin Swamp is an old glacial lake bed. As the glaciers receded, they left large lakes, which eventually dried up or broke through. <clears throat> but some of the biggest swamps lie in those old glacial lake beds. Swamps also contain deep areas of ponded water. These are termed vernal pools. As a wooded swamp again, People are always driving through these things. Mm -hmm. And maybe one could understand when you heard Vivian speak about the loss and the stirring up and the release. Not only is this destructive to the biodiversity, <coughs> it starts the cycle of methane release. <coughs> Next one, please, Vivian. And here we have even more destruction and development. They put up silk fences to try to protect the swamp, and of course, that has a knock-on effect that the animals that live in the swamp can't get in and out, and they pile up behind the soap fence. Um, just wish we'd leave things alone. Um, here's a vernal pool, and they're really located in wooded swamps at the edges of or associated. People think that they're isolated, but in fact, they're generally always connected. If you look to the back of the picture, you'll see how that vernal pool moves into a forested swamp bank. Vernal pools are exceptionally important, not just because I've spent 30 years, <laughs> but they're really, they're almost like the estuaries of the temperate forest. 
There's so much biological productivity in these tiny often overlooked microbes. Uh, there we go. There we go. Here you see vernal pool in early spring. Here you see the eggs of the wood frogs in the vernal pool. And you see the leaf litter from last fall. Now, this all works very pretty. And there's a bit of ice skim on the top. You can see how cold it still is. But and there's some sphagnum moss in the front, Vivian, on the log. Um, but what I see is solar energy. All those leaves that fall into the wetland represent solar energy locked in. As they break down, yeah, stay there, please. Okay. As they break down, the wood frog tadpoles feed on the leaves, break them up, and they metamorphose in late June. And thousands and thousands and thousands of wood frogs leave, carrying all that energy back into the food chain. Most of the wood frogs are eaten, transporting that energy up small animals higher and higher. So this is really your base of your energy transport in your temperate forest food chain, wood frogs. And for a long time, people didn't really understand it. I was sort of called a crap bot by advancing these theories of nutrient cycling. And finally, I had my day in court. River Sound versus Old Saybrook, decided by the Supreme Court that the scientific evidence that wood frogs have a direct beneficial effect to nutrient transport and to water quality was established by case law in Connecticut. So when I, you see frogs and a beautiful thing, I see a giant nutrient cycling mechanism. Vernal pools can also contain spotted salamanders and also contain other salamanders that are rare. Here you see the spotted salamander egg masses. They come in two forms, cloudy and not cloudy. And we're never going to be able to figure out why. Mm -hmm. And if you see on one mass, you see the newly hatched little tiny larva there. Do you see them <coughs> on the white <coughs> mass? So those are another pretty wonderful species in vernal pools. Mm -hmm. My friend Dennis Quinn, who's co author of the book we just wrote, is an incredible photographer. Mm -hmm. And here you see actually a female depositing eggs underwater. That's an egg sitter. She's extruding eggs. That's an older mass, not from her, another animal. And it's the milky type of egg mass. Mm. And to see that is just remarkable. <clears throat> now, swamps are threatened. Um, this is a tough thing to talk about when it's commissioners and the people, but all wetlands are not created equal. There's a world of difference between an impoundment and a vibrant functioning system of swamps, bogs, and vents. And a good example of that is you go to West Twin Lake. The west arm of West Twin Lake is actually the flooded stream bed of Chenard Brook. When that was flooded, it covered over bends and swamps and replaced them actually with a rather ecologically simple methane and CO2 emitting wetland. Now, I know a lot of people like West Lakes and they're wonderful. But I go look at them and I say, gee, what was once here? And if you look at the pattern, you can look at the old maps, you can see all the swamps and bogs, not bogs, swamps and vents that were flooded. So I think we have to understand that we've damaged, but we can undamage. And let me tell you something that once happened, some of you may remember it. 
when we have one of the biggest threats to the huge swamp that occurs that stretches from Salisbury into Massachusetts. A huge area of wooded swamps and bends that parallels Thunder Mountain Road through Connecticut into Massachusetts is recognized as one of the richest and most diverse ecosystems in New England. It's an area of critical environmental concern in the common of Massachusetts. But in the 1970s, I don't know if you remember this, <clears throat> there was a plan put forth by smart, smart people, Eversource, actually at that time was Northeast Utilities. And they had a plan which was very ambitious. They were going to build a dam. They were going to flood everything north of Twin Lakes, Hammertown Road, Grasslands Farm, all of that was going to be flooded. The lake was going to extend all the way north of Berkshire School Road in Massachusetts. And the plan was to pump all that water up to the top of the Taconic Uplift. There is a video when Northeast Utilities was promoting this in the early 70s, showing them blasting off the top of the Taconic Uplift to create a huge lake on the top of what is most of the town of Mount Washington. And there's a voiceover on that video that says, here at Northeast Utilities, we get things done. <laughs> well, there was a lot of, fortunately, a lot of opposition. And I think Northeast Utilities underestimated the fact that they couldn't divide and conquer the two states. And then they had a, so their own comeuppance. They found out that the rock of the Taconic Uplift was unsuitable to drill the big tunnels that where the turbines were located. Not to be deterred, they said, well, let's find another place. Province Swamp and Cana Mountain, the next on the list. This went on for a good period of time in the 1970s, but things began to change. The Water Act, people started to realize that not everything was good about this. And then the thing that really saved all of this was Three Mile Island. <laughs> I am the oil embargo because basically people began to realize that we can't engineer everything without serious problems. And the entire thing fell apart. So, had it gone through, we would have lost all those beautiful swamplands, peatlands, bends. And uh, that flooding, by the way, would have included Lower Sages Ravine, including that beautiful lunch pool right at the bridge in Joyceville. So this is very instructive. One thing as an environmentalist, nothing should ever be taken for granted in terms of conservation when placed against the engines of so-called economic progress. What we fight all the time is the concept of the commons that we hold in trust all together. Mm -hmm. And we have to continually reassert that against private property interests or private corporate interests. And I think that's the ongoing battle. There's always going to be, nothing is ever safe forever. <laughs> and that is sort of the real, real thing. You've got to be vigilant to protect all of these wonderful places. And here's a, my ending statement. This is another of Dennis's photos. This is another way we damage wetlands. We kill so much of wetland wildlife on our roads. Every spring, we use so, lose so much just on small secondary roads. And she's about 20 years old. The one this way? Mm -hmm. 20, 25 years. What is it? It's a spotted salamander. It's the most common of the mole salamanders. Yeah, we have a couple others in town too. We have Jeffersons, which are state listed, marbled, which are regionally rare. 
and blue spotted, which is day listed. This is the most common of the vernal world breeding salamanders. We, uh, it was kind of difficult to end with this slide because it's very sad because it's a salamander in the headlights, and you know it's, but we're all sort of in the headlights if we're not aware of what's going on and don't continue to raise our voices and our intellect and um, take heed of where the world is going. Um, there's a page on 169 in the book, for those of you who have or will read the book, that Prue writes about. And I it really caught my attention. Lawyers, listen up. Um, it's about a rights of nature case, which is a new theory coming up. And she writes about this. Um, the book came out. Uh, the case was filed in Orange County, Florida, which really caught my attention, which would have been something that might have come across my desk. And the Department of Environmental Protection was a named defendant to uh, prevent the department from issuing um, dredge and fill permits. It was a consortium of people who brought the case on behalf of lakes, streams, marshes, um, and, and in, in the, that we're in the path of a large development. The development was a 1900 acre housing development, which would destroy more than 63 acres of wetlands, 33 acres of streams by filling and by creating 18 acres of stormwater detention ponds. That's not it. Those details are not there. I went looking for this case because it was in Orange County and I wanted to know what happened to it because she was giving, um, she was giving, you know, uh, hope to uh, these licensed these uh, cases. And um, I said, wow, let's see what happened. Uh, the Rights of Nature Charter Amendments were overwhelmingly adopted by Orange County voters. This is the biggest county, almost the biggest county, 1.7 million voters in Orange County. And they overwhelmingly adopted a charter amendment to allow them to file such lawsuits. And that was in November of 20. And then the lawsuit was filed in April of 21, but it was thrown out of the court. Why? Because the Florida legislature had passed a preemption of any such charter amendments. And so the uh, amendment was ruled unconstitutional. But the movement is out there. And I mentioned that there are people, there must have been enough people who garnered themselves and, and voted for this very fine amendment. Um, so we, you know, again, vigilance is, is important, um, but there are a lot of people out there that are looking at ways, and I'm familiar with the area that this would have been um, placed in, and who knows, maybe, I don't know what the status of it is now. I did check into it. There hasn't been an appeal taken, and there has not been a, as yet, a challenge to the preemption law. So there are options, um, but nothing has happened as of yet. So I just, because it was there at the very back of the book, I wanted to, to mention it. So it is something that, it, it's, it's, it's going forward in some other countries. There have been cases, rights of nature cases, but I don't know of another one in this country yet. That's really very logical. If Citizens United makes corporations people, why can't yeah. reference be people, yeah. ecosystems? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is on, on behalf of Lake Mary and some other right. areas. I think, yeah. I think this is kind of, I think with time, this is going to get more traction. Right. I just think it's cutting edge. Yeah. And I'm sure glad I wasn't there when it was going to come across my desk. <laughs> Did it have the permits? Being withheld, or I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the status of that. I don't know the status of that. Pardon? No, that was no, that that was it. No, that. Oh, speaking of legislation, do we have time to talk about the wetlands update? Sure do. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, lots of time. 
And we're at 624. We have um, 15, 16 more minutes. Okay, so we'll talk about the wetlands update. Um, well, about a year ago in November, um, a, a committee was formed, three members from the Inland Wetlands Commission, and I'm one of those members, and three members from the DMZ Commission. Ta -da. Dr. Clemens is a very vital member of that committee. Uh, we call it the Joint Committee. And we've been- <laughs> We don't smell joints. We don't <laughs> smell joints. And my dear colleague, my dear colleague over here made sure that I was going to chair this. So that's been a lot of fun. We're meeting tomorrow and it's by Zoom. You can find the link and listen in at noon tomorrow. We're meeting again after several months of hiatus. But we started meeting last November every week, every Friday morning from 8 eight thirty until 10.30, sometimes later, looking at the regulations, trying to upgrade certain areas, um, improve certain areas, and um, we haven't gotten them um, passed yet by the Wetlands Commission, the full commission, and uh, we're going to meet again tomorrow to, to um, see what things we need to do to maybe get the commission to take this up and move it forward. Now, what would you like to talk about? Well, I think first we got to clarify. We advise the Wetlands Commission. Wetlands Commission then hopefully will eventually have draft wetlands regulations. Right. They will go to DEEP, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and then go to a public hearing. And there's been a lot of misinformation floating around about horrible things that are going to happen, confiscatory sort of things. And I think we haven't even, people haven't even seen, really understood. But several of the types of habitats we've spoken about tonight have been the focus of some very special parts of the regulations. Because I think you've seen uh, how sensitive fens are, how important thermal pools are, other things such as high gradient streams. These are resources that um, we need to protect for the future. And not just for Salisbury, because you look at the climate change models, the work on the retraction of the hemlock, Salisbury is probably going to be the last refugia for many cold tolerant species in the state of Connecticut. So our land has tremendous regional importance for the state, for the tri-state region. This Taconic uplift that I spoke before is going to be the last refugia of many species that are going to disappear with warming temperature. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot. We have we have what we call a real legacy stewardship responsibility. Mm -hmm. We talk about our landscape here. And I would urge you all to um, <coughs> stay tuned. Uh, there, these are very serious issues. Um, we've been very deliberative about what we've been doing. We have added more definitions and more commentary to the regulations so people will understand various definitions and commentary like calcareous fins and vernal pools and a lot of other things we've really beefed that up. And um, now without going into real specifics, we're looking at um, it's very interesting, very different from, from Florida. It's very interesting here. In, in Connecticut, you have what is called an upland review area, a URA, a URA, where you have a wetland, and then you have a, 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 an area of upland review, which is not an area of regulation, but an area of review. So that when a permit comes before the Wetlands Commission, we automatically are able to look at that upland review area and see what the impact will be or could be, might not be any, to that water body, whether it's usually a lake here, 
could be a stream or a river, but we're Lakeville and Salisbury with lots of lakes. So it's the lakes that are really being looked at very heavily and uh, closely. So what goes on in that URA and where the agencies, um, again, it's not a regulatory area. It's an area that allows you to look at automatically what might happen to the water body. You want to add to that? Yeah, I think the we look at the different sensitivities of certain water bodies and realize that it makes sense to have a larger area to look at. And one of the things that people have gotten bogged down, no pun intended, <laughs> in all of this is that right now the Inland Wetlands Agency has by statute if they can prove the reasonable likelihood of unreasonable harm, they can look 100 feet, 500 feet, 1,000 feet. That's in the state enabling legislation and in the court cases. But somehow there's a lot of concern. We talk about expanding the upland review area. People seem to think we're confiscating their property rights. And I said, we're actually making sure that which that the commons that we all hold together are really stewarded properly. And that's really what, what there's the rub, really, is this sort of uh, concern about so called regulatory overreach mm -hmm. and um, sort of a lot of misinformation because it's a review area. It's a review area. It's not a regulatory area. It's a review area. May I ask a question? Sure. And a question. You're mentioning only a 500 feet or a thousand feet. Is that enough? Mm -hmm. Shall we tell you what the current <laughs> URA is? Yes. Spelled like 375. 75. Yeah, one of the lowest in the state. But yet, state law requires so each each um, each. Um, what's each town? Yeah, it's, it's by town. I mean, there's a each town can set its own URS. I see. The court's unusual. Pardon? I see. So the state has has defined the concept, but each town gets to define the limits. Correct. Or, it's the same thing with planning and zoning. Mm -hmm. This is New England. There is tremendous deference given by the state to local authority. There's broad enabling legislation, and we can't stray beyond that. But there's broad ability for towns to adopt regulations that fit their town yeah. and fit the value of their resources. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your committee, your joint committee, had codified their recommendations and now presented them. Can we see them someplace? Oh, online? absolutely. Where does one go? Um, uh, so to Salisbury and to the uh, um, Inland Wetlands link, and then you will you will see the um, is the town of Salisbury. The town of Salisbury, Salis yeah, the town of the Salisbury State, and then you'll have a drop down, and you'll go to the Inland Wetlands drop down. And you'll see there'll be all kinds of um, um, what am I looking for? Why don't I help me? Menus. menus. Well, no, not menus, but there'll be there'll, there'll be uh, documents, documents that are there that are stored, that are filed. And um, is there a name of this document? Or? No, you'll just I I can I I'm not online here. I can. Um, Joint subcommittee. I, it's the joint subcommittee would have that. Yeah, yeah. right. Joint subcommittee. And if we well, and if you'd like to sign in tomorrow, there <laughs> you will get a you can have a link to even listen up tomorrow to see what we're about. Yeah. Ron, and we had if they're all all of our meetings, interestingly enough, every yeah. last one of our meetings has not only been open to the public and noticed to the public, but recorded and minutes are all in so that document. Go there and just read the recommendation. Yeah. And those are pending now and they're, yes, they've been presented to, they've been sent up to the commission. Um, we're hoping maybe things will move. Uh, 
fast. Yeah. And that's part of the problem is it hasn't moved fast enough. So the longer something like this lingers, the more concern there is. We started this a year ago in November. This this group met in earnest every week. And it just doesn't move. In the same period of time, three months, <clears throat> Abby and I, we did the zoning maps for the whole town. <laughs> any other questions? I don't see any other hands out there. And then there's one on Zoom. Any, any, oh, is there any questions on Zoom? I don't know how you'll figure that out. Yeah, I think you can just unmute and ask your question if anyone has a question. Are there just those few people on Zoom? Who we see on the right? I see five. There's five people besides us. Yeah. Yeah. Can the person unmute? Yeah, if you if you have a question, go ahead and unmute. I just want to say thank you for the presentation. There are currently 17 of us here on, on Zoom. Oh. Hi, Krista. We, we can't get anybody. No, we certainly do. You, yeah. Okay. Well, there being no more questions. I don't, I, excuse me, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Okay. Um, um, if you go to the New York Public Library events page, which is where the um one of the other programs in the uh email that contained this one is located and you go to archived events there's an interview of annie pruel uh at the library in uh, last october uh, which i think many people here would find interesting okay thank you yeah. she's everywhere who's that yeah annie. annie she just got on the one x thing Oh, she's involved with one X now. I didn't hear all the so I think. You know, with that whole system that they have, the super GIS system that's been developed. So people who are hunters and fishermen now can go and find out where all the truly public lands are in the West. Many of them are landlocked or have been landlocked deliberately by ranches. So they have to go through the corners to get. And she's been involved in that. Her name came up on one of those land forms that she wrote about. She's from Connecticut. Yes, she's from the Northeast Connecticut, the Quinnebog. Uh, great bogs and swamps there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want to say thank you for all the incredible hard work you've been putting in all the meetings and the volunteer work that you both did. And Michael also a few with PNC as well. Yes, uh, we're it's Beth Eisner calling in from Florida. Thank you all so very much. We live on Under Mountain Road also, and I drive north, and I think this is so gorgeous. But now I will look at it with far greater appreciation. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Yeah, just going to. If anyone's interested, we will put the recording up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Every day is wild. Thank you.